It is, of course, very challenging for me to talk uh, after Peter Snolan very impressive uh, speech. Uh, nevertheless, I will try to perhaps uh, uh, say something additional or different. Especially, I will look uh, on this Silk Road issue uh, from the different perspective, namely from the perspective of Europe and Euro-Asia. I will perhaps also focus more on the current situation and uh, on the economic issues. So uh, more specifically, I will talk a little bit about two competing integrations in Europe, European Union and the new Euro-Asian Economic Union. I will try to illustrate the problem on showing you different economic dimensions of these two integrations. Then what happens if uh, China comes in? Uh, we get the Silk Road. Uh, I will illustrate these issues on trade and foreign direct investment patterns. Then a few words and speculations uh, whether European Union, Euro-Asian Economic Union, and the Chinese uh, Silk Road initiatives are rivers uh, or partners. And last but not least, a few uh, challenges and conclusions. Okay, I will not talk about uh, European Union because uh, this is uh, well known uh, for this audience, but uh, just uh, to tell you a few words about this uh, Russian-led post-Soviet integration. Uh, this uh, has a long history. Uh, here is just a part of this history. Uh, sh oh, sorry. Shown uh, from uh, uh, 1995. That means this is basically about the uh, last 20 years. And uh, where we are now, uh, since January 2015, we have this newly established uh, uh, Euro-Asian Economic Union, which uh, had three finding uh, countries, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Russia, and uh, soon afterwards, uh, Armenia and Kyrgyzstan joined. And uh, there are plans and prospects for additional members uh, coming in, perhaps in the near future. Although, I have to say that the recent uh, political economic development on this Euro-Asian economic space is not particularly encouraging for the future prospects of this integration arrangement. But this is just by <coughs> the way as a remark. Uh, what are the economic dimensions? And this is a part of the problem which this Euro-Asian uh, economic integration is facing. Uh, I would just like to remember that uh, we have in the European Union uh, discussions about dominating role of Germany and uh, there are some other uh, economic partners like France, uh, Spain, Italy, of course if United Kingdom is leaving then these proportions will change uh, but uh, Compared to the uh, dominance of Russia on this uh, Euro-Asian continent, uh, you see that the uh, problems of different rights of individual member states in European Union are really of a minor importance. Now, let's uh, look at the wider Euro-Asia. There are some plans prospects or ideas about the wider Euro-Asian integration, this cooperation from Lisbon to Vladivostok and farther beyond to Shanghai. And this is a kind of illustration of part of this Silk Road or Silk Belt. And you see how the proportions on this wider uh, Europe. Asian continents are changing. Uh, Russia becomes a marginal partner. Even European Union is not so dominating. And you see that China 
is uh, basically one third of this uh, Euro-Asian wider economy, which has, of course, a number of uh, geopolitical, strategic, and other implications. So this is just to show you some of the dimensions. Let's look at the trade flows on this Euro-Asian continent. And you see uh, this includes always the intra-European trade, for instance. Yeah? Uh, Intra-Asian trade is also included. And uh, the message here is that uh, uh, there are very many disproportions and uh, different uh, dependencies on trade. Uh, you see that, uh, for instance, if uh, I just focus on this CIS, which is basically the former Soviet Union, you see that uh, uh, CIS is really a marginal export market for both European Union and uh, for Asia, including China. Uh, on the other hand, CIS, or especially Russia, is very much dependent on European Union market. You see that more than 50% of uh, Euro-Asian uh, or Russian exports go to Europe. And even Asia is very important for the CIS. 18% of exports go there. So again, this is uh, a illustration of uh, these different trade and economic dimensions. And I perhaps uh, uh, focus in a few minutes now on what does it all implies for Russia. So uh, Russia has been in crisis uh, already before this uh, conflict in and over Ukraine started. Russia has been so-called stuck in transition well before all these unfortunate developments happened. Uh, currently, Russia is very much affected by falling export revenues, and there are very uh, serious questions about growth sustainability. Currently, there is no growth in Russia, but rather the recession. There has been attempts to diversify and modernize the Russian economy. And one of the topical issues uh, for Russia especially has been this integration on the post-Soviet space. And partly as a result of the conflict with the West and over Ukraine, uh, there has been this switch of the pivot to China. That means that not only the United States sees China as a key global player, but Russia as well. And Russia has a number of uh, reasons why to uh, attempt to diversify from the European Union to the East, especially to China. What, again, can one say about the trade relations? Here you see uh, the most important uh, Russian trading partners, both uh, regarding Russian exports and Russian imports. And why I would just like to point out that uh, China has been de facto the main export partner, if we abstract from Netherlands, uh, because uh, Netherlands' uh, share of more than 13% results from the so-called Rotterdam effect. Most of the Russian oil is being exported via Rot Rotterdam. Besides that, you see that China is just an important export partner as Germany, for instance. And look at imports. Uh, almost 20% of Russian imports are originating in China, much more than in Germany. These are the numbers for 2014. Uh, last year, Russian trade collapsed uh, very much by about 
25-30% uh, dependent on how we measure it. The main reason has been the uh, collapse of the oil price and uh, devaluation of the Russian currency, which led to a reduction of uh, uh, Russian imports. Uh, the share of China slightly increased. Uh, trade with China dropped as well, but not as much as with uh, the European Union. What has been happening in trade with China? Uh, first, uh, you see here, uh, this is Russian Federation, okay? And you see that this is a huge territory. Uh, the latest available regional di data uh, show on this map uh, how much exports is originating from individual Russian regions. Of course, this uh, depends very much on the statistical methodology, how these uh, exports are registered. But the point is that uh, these far eastern regions are uh, much less populated. They are much poorer as a rule. And uh, the distances are extremely large. This island is Sakhalin, which belongs to Russia, and is an important source of uh, Russian energy export, both to China and to Japan. Uh, Russia exports to China, mostly oil, gas, metals, and other commodities last year uh, about uh, 20 billion euros. On the other hand, Russia imports from China mostly machinery and other equipment. And what is interesting is that uh, China is one of the few Russian trading partners where Russia has trade deficit. In all other trade direction, uh, Russia has uh, usually huge trade surplus, but not not with China. So there is, uh, uh, on the one hand, this asymmetry in the trade balance, and most important is the asymmetry regarding the commodity composition of uh, exports and imports. What about the foreign direct investment? You see that uh, China, uh, so far, uh, has been very marginal. Uh, investor in Russia. This has been changing sl slowly, but still Russia is, uh, uh, or China is not an uh, important uh, investor in Russia. Uh, what has happened uh, in 2014 and also 2015, uh, uh, there has been a huge disinvestment in Russia so uh, the uh, uh, stocks of foreign direct investment dropped. Uh, for instance, uh, uh, investments from Cyprus to Russia dropped by nearly 100 billion dollar in 2004. Pardon? The, well, well, this is uh, in the context of these Pan Panama Papers, uh, just an illustration that uh, uh, these offshore heavens, like uh, apart from Cyprus, uh, Virgin Islands, Bermuda, Bahamas, and so on, uh, are very important. And what I wanted to point out is that this uh, discussion about these uh, Panama Papers is basically nothing surprising and nothing new. We knew that there has been a huge, uh, so to say, circulation of uh, Russian money going via these different offshore heavens. And these are official data by the Russian Central Bank. So this is not something uh, from investigative journalists, but this is uh, data reported by the uh, Russian Central Bank. OK, but this is just uh, uh, an illustration. Uh, coming back again to this uh, uh, Silk Road issues, uh, from the Russian perspective and uh, uh, Russian trade with Asia or China, 
Uh, the most important is, of course, this energy. And you see here the existing and planned uh, oil and gas pipelines, which uh, partly have been already agreed, but most of these projects are still on the paper. Of course, the collapse of the oil price changed the whole picture recently. But the point is that uh, the construction of these uh, pipelines would require enormous investments, which are very scarce, especially in Russia, uh, given the uh, financial situation. And uh, the oil price changed the picture. But there will be an attempt uh, by Russia to reduce dependence on exports market in European Union and to switch the pivot uh, to China as well. Let's look uh, at another part of the Silk Road. Again, this is a, a slide which I uh, took over from the uh, United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, which did also a study on uh, transport links and so on. Uh, again, the point is that distances are very low. If we look at the uh, train, there was this first uh, train from China to Spain, from the Yivu. How do you spell it? I don't know. Yivu. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, uh, it is uh, a little bit shorter than the transport by sea, about half uh, of the time. But there are many obstacles. You have to switch uh, the gauge three times because you have different size of the tracks. And there are many other uh, bottlenecks uh, related to uh, safety, logistical problems, and so on. So this is not an easy and, uh, and, and cheap uh, logistical uh, enterprise and it will have uh, many implications if this should be, so to say, uh, used on a more regular way. So what does it all mean for the European, China, Euro-Asian uh, relations? So just very briefly uh, a repetition, uh, these differences in export structure in both uh, the European Union and China, and uh, besides that, we have a very strong evidence for European Union, China, intra-industry trade, which again has implications for the capacity utilization of uh, the Silk Road and uh, possible other uses. Uh, on the other hand, uh, imports from Russia, both European Union and Chinese imports are made up of mineral fuels and some other commodities, which means that uh, as far as Russia is concerned, the key is the pipelines, not so much uh, rail or road transit, but the pipelines are the key. And uh, uh, this Euro-Asian uh, economic union could be used perhaps as a transit uh, territory for European Union Chinese manufacturing trade. Next uh, few points is that we have these uh, oil and gas pipelines, we have uh, rail, we have Chinese uh, funds which uh, should be used or are being used for the modernization of uh, the infrastructure. Uh, there are some money from the Chinese Silk Road Fund, from the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, and uh, Russian own investment resources are scarce, as I have already mentioned. Uh, there is a, a special bank in St. Petersburg, uh, name is Euro-Asian Development Bank, which provides some, uh, I would say, minor loans for some infrastructure development in countries 
memberships uh, of the Euro-Asian Economic Union in Kazakhstan, Armenia, Kyrgyzstan, and partly also in, in uh, Tajikistan. And finally, my last uh, slide uh, attempts to make some conclusions uh, and uh, perhaps uh, to pinpoint out the most uh, important messages which I wanted to convey to you. Uh, this uh, Russian attempt to diversify exports and switch the pivot to China. From the Chinese perspective, uh, China has also interest to develop these uh, Western backward and drastic regions. This Qianyang is uh, very problematic and one of the ideas of Chinese for developing the Silk Road is to bring some development assistance, what we could say, to these Western Qiang, mostly Muslim uh, populated uh, regions. So uh, there are also other than poorly economic uh, considerations for uh, pursuing this uh, Silk Road, uh, Silk Road uh, project. Uh, in addition, both China and Russia aim to counter this US-led TTIP and TTP integration projects. Uh, one has to point out that uh, from both these trans-Pacific and trans-Atlantic Atlantic integration, uh, Russia and China are excluded explicitly. And this, of course, has uh, also implications for the attempt somehow to counter uh, this uh, development. We have uh, another Chinese attempt, this 16 plus one initiative, which is of particular interest for our region. 16 countries are new member states uh, of the European Union, plus the candidate countries in Western Balkan. So you see that this is a very diverse group, and one is China. So China would like to promote trade and investment with this region. So far, it has largely a symbolic character. Although, uh, two weeks ago, uh, Chinese uh, uh, Premier Xi uh, was in Prague and announced uh, huge investment plans in the Czech Republic. Yeah? For instance, uh, he uh, allegedly there have been deals uh, for investing more than 10 billion euros in the Czech Republic, partly for creating a joint investment fund, of course financed mostly by the Chinese capital. Uh, Škoda, Volkswagen, should invest 2 billion euros uh, for establishing capacities in China. So this is something very recent, an initiative which was announced virtually uh, two weeks ago. Whether it will be materialized, uh, we shall see. Uh, most of these projects are, of course, uh, plans uh, on the paper, and we shall see. So uh, last but not least, uh, I am always uh, advocating that uh, a closer integration of the European Union, this Euro-Asian Economic Union and China would uh, boost trade investments and growth in a wider Euro-Asia. This is especially important in the current situation when economic growth in Europe is very low or non-existent and uh, any, any uh, investment and integration initiatives which could contribute to overcome this growth weak weakness uh, should be welcome, I think. However, uh, there are serious uh, geopolitical consideration and uh, uh, probably in the short run, uh, these ideas are of little uh, practical uh, realization important, but I believe that 
in the medium and long run, the integration would be very beneficial on all partners concerned and uh, for countries like Ukraine and other countries in between, uh, these would be, uh, they would be relieved from uh, making this impossible either or choices, uh, which is uh, not very, I would say, popular uh, to say, uh, given the current uh, geopolitical situation and conflict. But if we look at the medium and long run perspective, and uh, Peter has mentioned that uh, China is looking on these developments in a really long-term perspective, and we should do the same, I think. So this would be something which uh, probably would be worth to pursue in a more organized way, put it this way. Thank you very much.